Uh, so the last speaker for this session, we have Dr. Darnens Johansson, a colleague of mine uh, from the Gemological Institute of America, and she's going to be talking to us about some very large, interesting diamonds from Botswana. Uh, good afternoon. Now, I know that I'm the last speaker of the day, and it's me, this, and then the cocktails. So I'm going to try to get through this quite quickly, but I do hope to hold your attention by talking about large diamonds. And by large diamonds, I mean very large diamonds. So recently there has been a lot of excitement about the material that is coming out of the Karoa mine in Botswana. In fact, one of the characteristics of this mine is that it's producing large, extremely large stones. According to them, approximately 20% of the recorded plus 30 carat plus stones in the world come from them. And we can see here that November 2015 was a very, very good month for them. In fact, they had a very good week when they extracted a series of extremely large stones in their Karoa mine. So we can see the very famous Lissetti La Rona with 1,109 11, carats in size, the constellation at just under 813 carats, one at 374, 296, and then finally one at 183. And this is just a few of the samples that they were recovering at the time. As Steve mentioned, their recovery process is a little bit of a dog's breakfast, but here we're looking at the nicest pieces of that breakfast. So how large are these stones? How do they compare to the other large stones around the world? Well, obviously the benchmark is going to be the Cullinan di diamond at 3,106, which was recovered 110 years prior to these Karoe stones. We can see the next one down, though, is going to be the Lassetti La Rona, which is just a little bit greater than a third of the size. And then if we work our way down, we can see the constellation at the seventh spot. Now, in fact, at the time, it was the sixth largest stone ever recovered, but since then, the Lesotho legend has been found in Litsang. Now, when we look at the Karoe mine, we have to think about how it's formed and what's present in it. So we have, the, this mine was discovered in 1969 by De Beers and eventually is bought by Lucara Corporation, which is based in Canada. Lucara created an open pit mine that opened in 2012, and they approximately have an annual production of 380,000 carats. They do expect that if they extend their mining to underground operations, they will be able to last until about 2036. Now the Kimberlite pipe that is part of the Karoa mine is the AK-6 pipe. And it is a opaque mineral rich monosolite Kimberlite. And what you can see here is that it has three different lobes. Let's see here, it has a south lobe, the center lobe, and the north lobe. Now, if we look at the mineral reserve statement for the Koro mine, we can see that the south lobe seems to be the winner. It has, obviously, the largest volume, but in addition to that, it has what's expected to be the largest dollar per carat price. Additionally, they expect that there's going to be a very high grade in this section. So from this, we can already tell that really, the place to look for diamonds at Koroi is going to be the south lobe. However, one of the issues that they face is that this material is extremely hard. In fact, they had to redesign their mine in order to upgrade it in 2014 with a large stone X-ray transmissive technology and change their mining practices in order to be able to process this much harder ore. However, as soon as they did that, they obviously had great success and were able to find these five stones in the study in November 2015. I mean, that would have been a fantastic month to be at that mine because can you imagine finding those big stones? And one of the interesting things is if you look at it here, they've just started mining this material which they believe is going to produce even larger stones through the years. It will be exciting to see what this mine produces. Now, I was extremely lucky to visit the Karo mine with my, car, uh, well, my colleague Karin and Evan, who spoke earlier. And as you can see here, 
The scientists at Koroe have actually been plotting where they're finding all of their large stones. And one of the neat things is all of those stones that we're discussing today were found in the same location. So obviously we're going to start wondering, are they related in any way? So significantly, Lucar has already stated that the Lacetti Lorona and the 374 carat stone are considered to be part of the same rough, i.e. they broke off at some point. They call it a sliver of the Lacetti. However, if we look at the Lacetti Lorona, and we notice that this is sort of where the 374 carat stone fit in, there's still a large unaccounted for cleavage face. So this is where we really started wondering whether these stones that are remarkable in size, remarkable in clarity and color, might actually be related. Are they part of the same rough? And that is really the key question that we're trying to solve here. So thanks to the clients that GIA has, we've actually been extremely lucky to inspect these stones at different stages of their process. We were able to look at the constellation, the 296 and the 183 carat stones in their rough forms. And additionally, since then, they've started cutting these stones and we've been able to investigate the faceted forms as well. The Lacetti Lorona, we have access to two offcuts as well as a range of smaller stones that have been cut from the Lacetti. And then for the 374 carat stone, unfortunately, we weren't able to inspect the rough, but we have seen the faceted diamonds produced. Now, I'm going to try to link them based on spectroscopic tools. It would have been lovely to have all of these different pieces together in the same room at the same time, but unfortunately, that was not the case. So instead, we're going to look at the presence and absence of defects, these impurities that several of our colleagues today have been discussing. One of the techniques that we use that is very powerful is FTIR. It's looking at the absorption of light as it goes through the diamond in the infrared range. And one of the interesting things is, that the Lacetti Lorona has both type 2A and type 1AB portions. It has a section that is very high purity material with no nitrogen, and then it has another section that appears to have a significant concentration of B centers. So these are four nitrogen atoms surrounding a vacancy. And this is something that is produced through geological timescales as the isolated nitrogen aggregates into this final form. Now, looking at the FDR absorption for the other pieces, we found that they also are type 1AB. And we were able to quantify this and found that it was approximately 20 parts per million. Now, one of the key things here is that to make them the largest type 1AB stones ever recorded. So that's interesting. But also, you see, they actually match really quite well. All these type 1AB sectors have the same concentrations. Now, this is rare. How rare is this? Well, when people usually think of large colorless diamonds, they think of the beautiful type 2A diamonds that Evan was speaking about earlier today. They account for approximately 1.3 to 2% of natural gemstones. And they're prized because people think of them as being extremely pure. However, if we start looking at the, the type distribution of the larger stones that we see coming through that are D to Z color, we find that in fact, the type 1AB diamonds are significantly rare. At these size ranges, the type 2 diamonds, sorry, the type 2 diamonds account for approximately 25% of the stones, as the type 1ABs only account for approximately 1% of the stones. So they're very, very rare. Based on the inclusions and the diamond types of these materials, we do expect that they probably originate from the sublithospheric mantle, or possibly even deeper, due to the associated metallic liquid. Now let's try finding a little bit more evidence. Let's analyze some more defects that we can see. So one of the other techniques that we have available to us is photoluminescence. In this case, we're shining a laser at the stone, and then the defects react and emit light. And this gives us the signature of the defects present. Typically, natural diamonds are going to show a very highly variable photoluminescence characteristics. Some defects will be present in certain stones, some will be absent in others, and their relative concentrations are key indicators of the history of the stone. What we can see here is the photoluminescence spectra that was collected for all five of these stones using the 488 nanometer laser. And what we can see is the presence of the H4 defect, the 
stage three defect, which is two nitrogen atoms surrounding a vacancy, and a feature at 505. Now, one of the things you might notice here is that the relative intensities of all these peaks match up really nicely. Additionally, we looked at the width of the H3 peak because that gives us an idea of what the level of strain, how much stress the sample might have been at. And what we can see here is that they all match up really nicely. But I want some more evidence. Let's keep going. Let's analyze a little bit more. So we use the 514 laser instead. We can again sample different defects that are present in the material. In this case, the only thing we really saw was a GR1 center. So this is just a vacant lattice site. Additionally, very weakly, which doesn't show up very well here, there's a very, very weak 637 nanometer peak that's associated with the nitrogen vacancy center. The similarities in the peak heights and again the peak widths gives us very, very compelling evidence that these five stones are in fact part of the same rough, or at least they were formed in identical conditions. One of the things that you have seen earlier this morning was using the deep UV fluorescence for imaging of um, diamonds to see the growth zones, the growth sectors that are present. In this case, the 812 carat sample, we had to build our own kit because it was a little bit too big to fit into the diamond view. But nevertheless, you can see here that this sample appears to have two different growth zones. You have this brighter region here and this dimmer region at the bottom. Let's ignore for a minute this little darker region here because that just has to do with the secondary iron oxide staining that's present in the stone. If we look at the 296 carat stone and the 183 carat stone, which were actually the stones that we looked at first, at the time we didn't have our own kit, so we were able to squeeze them into the diamond view and just look at a few different sectors. So here we can see again a bright zone and a darker zone and it appears that there's a line going through. And here again, we can see a bright zone and a darker zone. So from that, we can already see that there are at least two different zones in these three stones. Additionally, the faceted stone that was produced from the 374 carat stone also showed two zones. And the Lissetti Rona, we know, has at the very least two zones because there's a type 2A sector and a type 1AB. There were also a few inclusions. Generally speaking, uh, clipper diamonds such as these are going to have very, very low concentrations of inclusions, but we were able to observe a few that appear to be metallic in character, again, consistent with the clipper story from Evan. Also, th three of these stones have this metallic reddish rust, effectively, um, inclusions that are just alterations from the interior material when they were exposed to the uh, surface. So again, these are samples that are very, very consistent. Now, I'm going to try to match some of these stones. When it comes to 812 and 296 carat stone, and we consider the different bright and darker zones that we observed in the fluorescence imaging, we can see that these stones actually do seem to fit in very nicely. You can see I've labeled the different corners, and you can just, like a clamshell, close them together. Let's see if we can do that with some others. Well, the 812 and 8, uh, 183, again, we were able to inspect those rough stones and had a series of images taken of them. And again, like a clamshell, we were able to join them up. So this corner here would match up here. And you can see, again, this feature, the step. If we look at that step a little bit more closely, we can see that it rises and lowers at exactly the same position. So again, they're mirroring each other, which again indicates that these were likely part of the same rough. And this is sort of what it would look like. So I've here color-coded just to show the different planes in the sample. And you can see here in green, these surface here were natural surfaces, whereas these here were cleaved surfaces. Now, if we were to flip this over, there's actually still a large unaccounted for cleavage plane. And this is really where we think that it would have in some way been joined up to the other two stones. So really, using a multi-technique analysis of point defects and their distributions, we have been able to link these different rough diamonds and say that they comprise of a single a diamond of remarkable historic and scientific significance. These stones, if you were to combine them, would be about 2,774. We do believe that there would be even more pieces that are missing because they don't 
all fit in together like a neat puzzle. Smaller than the Cullinan diamond, but it just indicates that these, this mine is going to be producing some really large remarkable stones in the future as well. They have continued to change the way that they're doing their mining and are trying to make sure that they can recover these large stones better in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, are there any questions for Rika? <coughs> Go ahead. Maybe a very stupid question. I, I, I was a mine owner, I was in all the sites, and found that they were different diamonds. The fact is, could it just be one thing? Well, yes, this is a freakishly large diamond, as you say, but at the same time, you've seen the images that uh, Graham was showing us that was just lots and lots of large diamonds. So, yes, these are extremely large, but there are still plenty of 100 car carat pluses coming out of there. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, just a question about types. Uh, mm -hmm. I see a quarter of the all diamonds are 2A or low nitrogen 1AB. Beside the higher colors, uh, there are also lower colors, light brown, that could be HPH treated. Does the company uh, selling these uh, as potential uh, stones for HPH treatment, or it's only selling uh, rough, rough as it is? Uh, would you mind repeating Is it uh, the some light brown stones that are potentially could be HPH treated because they are low nitrogen diamonds, type 2A? What colors are coming from the mine? Colors. Well, from the look of it, they have a range of different colors. Obviously, the, the ones that we're seeing mainly are the colorless material. Um, if they do have type 2A brown material, yes, that would be a candidate for decolorization. Okay, yes, Jim? This is more of a curiosity question you may not know the answer to, but one of your slides you mentioned they installed new x-ray equipment. Do you know anything about that technology? Presumably it's to catch larger stones before you go into the crusher. Uh, what are they doing, do you know? Um, I'm afraid I don't really know too much about that. Sorry to disappoint. But if I can access my slides again. Thank you. But I can show you at least a neat diagram of it. If it scans through. Oh, sorry. There we go. So that's pretty much a, a diagram that illustrates their uh, processing at the Kuroi mine. And you can see that they go through several different levels. I will see how much more information I can get on that for you, Jim. Sorry. It's post-crusher. It's post the crusher, yes. This is XRT, something. So they, they look for element six. <laughs> so they recover all the plastic rubbish in the diamond. <laughs> Would you repeat that? It's an XRT circuit, so it, it looks for element six. It doesn't look for diamonds specifically, but it, it, will, uh, it uses technology that is from the food industry and will remove all particles from a stream of particles that contain element six. That's simply what it does. I.e. carbon. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other instances of, of a type 1A or type 1B growth um, upon a type 2 diamond, or is, this, or is this unprecedented? No, we have actually observed um, uh, diamonds that have type 2 and type 1AB hmm. uh, joint growth. Right. Well, thank you. So sing, single faceted stone. So ideally, what I'd like to see eventually is from, from the Lassetti, some of the pieces that they're cutting, I'd love to see one that actually comprises those two zones. Thanks. Well, if there are no other questions, um, let's thank all our speakers again for the session this afternoon. Thank you very much.